Hello 8D, good morning. Miss Slopesack here with Sophie. Uh, we are going to start our uh, read aloud this week of Shattered. Uh, and so I'm going to read you chapter one. It's going to be in two separate videos just because chapter one and two seem to be longer chapters in this book and then they seem to get shorter um, as we go along. So just to recap, this uh, book is about 15 year old Ian and much like you will have to do, he has to do some volunteer hours uh, in order to complete a high school course. And the problem is, is Ian has not really paid attention and has inadvertently signed up to do these volunteer hours at a homeless shelter. Um, and he kind of encounters a few life experiences that uh, give him some new perspective on the world. So what I want to do today is while I'm reading chapter one, uh, your activities this week really focus on Ian's character. So I want you to listen for clues about who Ian is, what his life is like, what his family is like, where he comes from, um, and who do you think he is as a person. So I've got Sophie here. She's going to read with us today. And uh, like I said, I'll stop halfway through chapter one, and then you have to click on the next video. Okay? Shattered, Eric Walters. I turned the collar up on my ski jacket. The wind was bitterly cold and was blowing directly into my face. It was the first day of spring, but it just didn't feel like it. Instead, it was just another cold day in an endless winter of cold, snowy days. At least it wasn't snowing right now. It was the coldest winter I could remember, and my father told me that there was one even worse 12 years ago, but I was only three then and couldn't remember that far back. I looked at my watch, 10 to six. I had just over 10 minutes to get there. It wasn't good to be late for a job interview. Then again, it was an interview for a volunteer job. What was the worst that could happen? That I wouldn't get a job that didn't pay and that I didn't want to begin with? Then I thought about what would happen if I didn't get the job. My civics teacher had made it pretty clear that if I didn't get this job, she was not going to be arranging another interview for me. And she made it equally clear that if I didn't get a placement, I couldn't pass. And my father already told me what would happen then. If I didn't get all of my credits, then I wasn't going to be getting a car for my birthday present. My, pro my father had promised me a car when I turned 16. That was what his father had done for him and what he said he was going to do for me. I don't know about what type. He'd been hinting about a BMW. It probably wasn't going to be anything fancy, maybe something in the 300 series. My father could afford to buy me a Beamer. In fact, he could afford to buy me a dozen Beamers. Maybe he wasn't around that much, but the money helped make up for that. Now thinking about that car, that job interview had some real meaning and I doubled my pace. As I walked, I kept my head up looking around. I didn't know the downtown very well and the times I'd been here with my parents for hockey game shows or shopping, it wasn't the part we had been to. There was clearly no theaters or fancy stores. Instead, the buildings were run down and seemed to be limited to dollar stores, pawn shop, laundromats, and a check cashing store. A couple of the stores had boards over the glass and the boards were plastered with posters and advertisements. Some of them even had curtains in the windows. Failed retail had become street level apartments. The streets themselves were dirty and strewn with garbage. It was actually dreary and depressing. But that shouldn't have been any surprise to me. Why else would they put a soup kitchen to feed hungry people? I shook my head. I still couldn't believe this. I was going to be doing my community hours at a soup kitchen. Sounded like something out of a bad movie or book by John Steinbeck. But I didn't have anybody to blame about myself. Why had I been so stupid? I hadn't bothered to read any of the information in the booklet that listed all the volunteer jobs. I just saw the name of the program, the club, and I thought it sounded classy. I guess it did have class, the lowest class possible. Then when my teacher told me what it really was, I couldn't back out. She'd already been on my case about how I was always taking the easiest route, how I always cut corners on assignments, I didn't take her class seriously. She was right. I didn't take her class, or any class for that matter, seriously. She then went on to tell me how surprised she was by my choice and that maybe she'd misjudged me. The truth was that she hadn't misjudged me. She actually made me a little uneasy. I got the feeling that she was always trying to figure everybody out. and I hated people like that especially those people who actually did have you figured out. I just wished I'd been smart enough to start my placement, any placement, when everybody else had started theirs. 
Somehow I just hoped that I could skate by without doing it. And when she didn't mention it to me, week after week I thought somehow she'd forgotten too. Now I only had three months to finish up my volunteer placement when it uh, took other people six or seven months. So here I was heading to the club, obviously somebody's idea of a joke. And unfortunately now the joke was on me. My timing was tight. It was still one block down and one block over, but there was a park on my right hand side. And if I went through the park, I could cut the angle and maybe just make it in time. I turned onto the gravel path that led diagonally across the park, exactly the direction I needed to go. I traveled no more than a dozen steps when I had second thoughts. This wasn't the best neighborhood and it was starting to get dark. I, I looked around anxiously. I didn't see anybody. And I guess even bums had better places to be than hanging around a park in the cold and dark. I'd keep my head up and my eyes open and, you got a smoke to spare? I jumped right into the air, spun around and stifled the urge to scream. There was a man standing in the shadows just off from the path. I had walked right by him and didn't see him at all. So much for keeping my eyes open. The man stepped out of the shadows and into the open. My heart was still pounding, but I took a good look at him. He was dressed in a large, dirty green parka with a matching green toque pulled low over his head and a few days of growth of gray and gritty beard on his face. I didn't mean to scare you, he said apologetically. He sounded like he meant it. Oh, you, you didn't scare me. I, I just was startled, that's all, I stammered. Didn't mean to do that either. You got an extra smoke I could have? I don't smoke. Smart. Wish I didn't either. Any spare change? He asked. Sure, I unzipped my jacket and reached inside, pulling out my wallet. I opened it up. Put that away! He snapped. I looked at him, confused and a little scared. What was he talking about? What did he mean? Put your wallet back in your pocket, he ordered. I was just trying to give you some change. I understand that and I appreciate that, but you can't be waving a wallet around here. You never know who's watching. He looked stern and serious. Slowly, I looked around. There were trees and bushes casting long shadows, but the park was deserted except for him and me. I don't see anybody. Just because you can't see them doesn't mean they can't see you, he paused. Just put your wallet away. I stuffed my wallet back into my pocket. You just have to be careful, he said. You never know who's around. I nodded my head. Did he really think we were being watched or was he just crazy? I've heard about people like this. What was that word again? Oh, paranoid. That was it, paranoid. I knew that a lot of the people who lived on the street were mentally ill, psychiatric patients. They heard voices or saw things that weren't there or believed people were watching them or were out to get them. But this guy didn't seem crazy. Then again, how did I know what was going on inside his brain? If he really was normal, would he be out here begging for change? There are people who would split your head open for a couple of bucks and you got more than a couple of bucks in that wallet. I saw when you opened it. I stepped back. It's not me you have to worry about, he said. There's not enough money in any wallet to make me hurt another human being. I didn't know him. He was just some street person begging for smokes and change. But somehow, I believed him. I think I have some change in my pocket. Not much, but some, I said. Anything you have would be appreciated. I dug into my pocket and rummaged around, and there was a few coins. I pulled them out and looked. Not much, a quarter, a couple of dimes, three or four pennies, and I dropped them in his outstretched hand. Thank you, he said. You're welcome. I'm sorry there isn't more. I appreciate what you gave. Some people, they don't even turn their heads. They act like I'm not even here. It's getting dark. You shouldn't be in the park when it's dark. Oh, I'm just cutting through. I've got an interview and I looked at my watch right now. I have to get going. And I rushed off down the path. Thanks, he yelled. And I looked over my shoulder. He gave a wave. Be careful, he called out. I nodded and kept going. Strange. Not what I expected. A bum who was polite and well-spoken and he had a trace of some sort of accent. I, I couldn't tell what but something. There was also something else about him. Maybe his manners. I had expected him to have manners. The way he stood, his shoulders were back, his posture was perfect. 
all very strange. With this warning to be careful, I tried to be more aware of what was around me. Coming up to a bench beside the path, I realized that it was occupied. There was a man stretched out on it. He was covered by a tattered old blanket pulled up on top of him, so only his head was peeking out. I shifted slightly over to the other side of the path as I passed. What a place to sleep. This guy had to be crazy or drunk or both. Up ahead, coming directly toward me along the path, was a woman pushing a shopping cart. The wheels were digging into the gravel and she was struggling to keep it moving. She was all stooped over and had a pronounced limp. Her clothing was a crazy patchwork quilt of colors and materials and items, and her cart was piled high. And as she got closer, it clearly wasn't filled with groceries. Empty bottles, folded cardboard boxes, newspapers, clothing, and rags. She was pushing a cart filled with garbage. As she got even closer, I heard her talking to herself. It was a loud, profane rant about the government. I squeezed over to the very edge of the path to create as much distance between us as possible. And as she got close to her, as she got close, her monologue got louder and louder. She looked up at me. Cold one, ain't it? And she flashed me a smile. Yeah, cold, I mumbled. She was crazy, but friendly. I looked back over my shoulder and watched and listened as she continued both her journey and her rant. I couldn't help but wonder what was going on in her head, what demons were driving her. But I didn't even have time to think about that. I had to get going as fast as I... Hey! I jerked my head to the side. Two men, well, really older teenagers, were cutting across the grass towards me. I turned away and kept walking. Maybe they weren't talking to me. Wait up, kid! There was no doubt now. Should I stop? Should I run? Another man appeared on the path directly in front of me. He told you to wait, the third man said. A shiver went right up my spine as I skidded to a stop directly in front of him. He stood there in the middle of the path, blocking my way. The path was narrow at this point, boxed in by hedges on both sides, sheltered and isolated. I looked past him, up the path, and there was nobody in sight.